two poets that we have reading in this set each has a whiff of iconochasm about them. Each is very proud of their working class origins. Each has a political sensibility. But it's a political sensibility that doesn't manifest itself in their work in a preachy um, manifesto type way. Um, they've also been known to use on occasion humour as an instrument of subversion. Although don't count them to read any funny poems tonight because they they might read something else. <coughs> Jerry Murphy was born in Cork, where he still lives. Uh, he's famous for his swimming and his running as much as he is for his poetry. <laughs> he was a life professional lifeguard. He's published seven collections of poetry, most recently uh, Muse. Before that was my flirtation with international socialism. Um, and he also did uh, a volume in the series of European translations that we published back in 2005. He did Katarzyna uh, Porun Jagod Zinska from Poland. Fiona Samson has described his poetry as uh, apparently effortless, uh, the kind that offers pleasures of instant recognition and the consolation of certainty of touch. Tom Pickard is one of those rare creatures who is admired and as well read uh, on one side of the Atlantic as he is on the other. He's been published on both sides of the Atlantic. He has uh, a deep history of involvement with poetry, both as a curator and as a poet. Uh, he co-founded the famous Morton Tower book room reading series in the north of England. He's the author of, of over a dozen poetry collections, as well as many volumes of fiction and non-fiction. He's also a writer for film, radio and television. Um, Basil Bunting, and you can't get a more classical endorsement than Basil, Wrote, his ear for rhythm is exceedingly delicate, his syntax strong and terse, and his vocabulary free of fancy work. <coughs> he seems able to select at will the detail which creates a whole scene or action. Tom is one of uh, four poets featured uh, in the festival who co coincidentally are all uh, together in the current issue of poetry as well. They're going to read an alphabetical order, so I welcome Jerry up first. Thank you. start with an in memoriam poem. Take the sadness out first. And it's uh, it's actually the first draft of it. I just finished it this afternoon, the first draft. So it's uh, <coughs> can you hear me? Is it okay? It's on the death of Sir Francis Bacon. You couldn't make this up. This martyr to science and experimentation was stuffing a roasted chicken with snow in pursuit of the secret of refrigeration and food preservation when he caught a chill, which soon turned to pneumonia, and he died. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> it's written as a biography by John Drury of George Herbert, and that information was just packaged nicely in it. I was asked recently if I'd written a poem on 1916, and I hadn't. So I was commissioned by a 12-year-old girl from Colossian Fear Street <laughs> to write a poem on 1916. It's called In the Balance, and it's for Chloe McCormack. 
There was an interlude between the rebels taking possession of the GPO at 12.20 p.m. and the unrelated arrival of British troops nearly two hours later when the situation could have been diffused and everything might have turned out differently. Imagine a no-nonsense Sergeant Major already in the GPO buying stamps, trying to talk sense to the rebels. All right, lads, you've had your fun. Let's all go home and forget this ever happened. We don't want this to go and end in tears now, do we? But then, at 2.15 p.m., a mixed troop of 9th and 12th Lancers on their way to Dublin Castle to investigate the disturbance came cantering down Sackville Street and straight into a hail of deadly fire from the roof of the GPO and the rest. <laughs> I'm going to concentrate because of the, the week that's in it and... Valentine's Day is on Sunday, and there's also reading in the Waterstones in the afternoon on Sunday, if anybody wants to come along uh, and read a poem, a love poem. I think there's only two booked so far, myself and Pat Cotter. Have <laughs> <laughs> you holding your hand, Terry? Well, don't have to be alone. Pat Cotter. But I'm starting with this poem, because I, I read this poem in, um, in a lecture theatre in... Shanghai about 2008 and it had the uh, effect of having all the students in the audience, about five or six hundred of them, the dean was sitting in the front and when I announced the title of the poem every head turned to the dean to see his reaction. <laughs> it's called A Note on the Demise of Communism. <laughs> I give the communist salute to my capitalist ex-girlfriend as she takes the corner of a clip in her black BMW, doles me out an imperious nod and leads me to choke back Marxist Leninist rhetoric in a plume of carbon monoxide. <laughs> Funny the way they turn out there. No, no, no. Feminist on beach in dress suit. This is originally dedicated to Pat Cotter and the dedication fell off it on the way to the printers. Dear Superman, I found your condom on the beach this morning. It must have washed up here with the early tide. I fancy it would cover the lighthouse if ever the need arose. You must have been fucking whales all night, judging by the distressed state of the ocean and those three stranded leviathans still grunting happily. I wonder what Lois would say if she heard of this. <laughs> it wasn't a love poem. Really. <laughs> but this is part of a poem to celebrate your next birthday. Keeping one eye open for minor fluctuations in the property market, keeping the heart pent up for spring, I watch you swim, I calculate your trade value. I could, of course, ask you out into the rainforests the jovial ice fields, the fresh air, onto the lunar surface, the veldt, the seafloor. Is there anything in particular you desire? There's nothing here for you, at least if it's all the same to you, nothing you can take home to mother. I am developing a fixed obsession for your navel, except perhaps a view of the river and floating quietly thereupon, a small passion for your breasts, a few dead priests, though there I say it, the hots, the very hots for your vulva, yes, and a cool, detached admiration for your legs. Not enough? Even if it is only a matter of days before the commencement of nuclear, oh shit, hostilities, are you digging in your Swiss bank account? And even if Castro is dead, sorry, I mean Lenin, at least it's spring, the birds are sing, being. There's a sharp, new cold wind streaking in from the Atlantic, and if you search carefully along the edge of this poem, or if you were along the edge of the Arctic Circle, you'll find references to your exquisite face, the pert delight of your breasts, the lovely so curves of your hips, the southern tip of South America, that sort of thing. Of course, if you are saving yourself from an associate professor and would rather not be identified too closely with this surrealist excess, as to be discovered at some future date and brought up before a Senate subcommittee hearing on the suitability of your husband, now a professor, as Ambassador to Papua New Guinea, just say so. I can take a hint. <laughs> should be drinking water. <laughs> Last surrealist litany of the 20th century. Go. Your hair which is Afro-style, autumnal, deep wood, long walks of the evening, 
You know, followers are somewhat obscured by Afro style autumnal deep wood long walks at evening type hair. Your eyes, which are blue or grey or green, which are deep as the sky or if you must to see. Your lips, which are as lips go, or surely temple your lips. Your neck, which must be turret of ivory, column or marble, miracle of steel, would hold in suspense without difficulty the San Francisco Bridge. Your breasts, which are hot and glossy and fit neatly into your bra. Persistent dream of your swimming, warm, glistening curves rippling under a red swimsuit on the first all woman expedition to the source of the Amazon. Your ties of Natalia Kuchinskaya, such ties begin quietly at the throat, then open out onto a spectacular view of Mount Fujiyama, inviting a long historic trek around the poles of your nipples, across the hot moonscape of your belly, towards the cool caravanserai of your navel, to create the legend of your vulva, smooth, powdered, smothered in jewellery, to the slow descent of your legs. Stop. Uh, you remember when the Pope came to Ireland in 19... Okay, Pope John... 78. 78. <coughs> 78. <laughs> How soon you forget. <laughs> anyway, he was in Knock, and I was watching the television, and there was a commentary <coughs> on the actual apparition at Knock, on the church history of it. And this is based on the, the actual description of the apparition. It's called Vision at Knock. A figure, perhaps John the Evangelist, and behind John an altar, and on the altar a lamb, and behind the lamb a cross, and behind the cross a wet gable wall, and behind the wall a pokey interior, and behind this pokey interior a dismal view of the countryside, and beyond this dismal view of the countryside, and a little to the right, the Cathedral of Minsk, and behind the Cathedral of Minsk, Stalin laughing. <laughs> since we're on the subject of great dictators. This is called A Poem for Herr Speer with hitherto unpublished historical details. In Hitler's arsehole there was a small trapdoor. <laughs> it opened in the event and only in the event of a final breakthrough on the Eastern Front. Inside you would find a secret tunnel which would lead you out under Berlin into a heavily concealed, well-stocked cave with all the facilities necessary to encourage the establishment of a government in exile. What more could any fascist want? <coughs> I did say look once, didn't I? If I can find one. <coughs> nice. This is called Close Call, and I think we've all been there at one time or other in our lives. When you're going out with somebody and she has a boyfriend already, and, <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't tell you. I don't know what you were thinking. Actually, I do. Pushing me into that doorway, kissing me into a breathless ferment, and then almost erasing me limb by shuddering limb with your frenzied frottage. We're on our way to the railway station, you to meet your boyfriend in the late train, I to break off long before and make my way home without a hint of affection. Perhaps this train was early, or more likely we'd been kissing too long and too well, as when we emerged flushed, mussed up and panting from that feral mall, he was all but upon us. I strode on dishevelled but purposeful towards the station, you drew me into your still trembling arms. It was like that close. <laughs> This is based on a poem by Nazim Hikmet. He's a Turkish poet who was, I think he died in the 60s. He died in Russia after being imprisoned in Turkey for about nearly 20 years altogether. It's called Youth. So here's the story. For 10 years our hands have been touched with dimension our lips. I grow older here, you wiser there. Love of my life, your neck is probably a little more lined, your breasts a little less firm. As for me, I have a nature starting you, so keep a weather eye open for the obituaries. But surely of all people we cannot possibly grow old. We need another term for ageing flesh, for inevitable entropy. Only those who have loved no one but themselves are doomed to grow old. Are we done for time? Yeah, ten minutes to go. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is called Patriarch. 
Imagine an eight-year-old atheist kicking his father on the shins while disputing the dubious veracity of the Old Testament. Now imagine the father's name is Joseph. <laughs> Even another eight minutes, Jerry. <laughs> Seven and a half. Right. Uh, there's a certain thing about Cork that Cork people have a certain sort of uh, attitude to the city itself that it's, you know, if you're born in Cork, you're extremely lucky, so on and so forth. This is based on um, a field at the top of Patrick's Hill called Bell's Field. And it's called Bell's Field Rivery. Can you imagine the wall at the top of Bell's Field as the ramparts of the Alhambra? Grona Brahar as the Albison, not Nahini as Sacramonte. Yet an October afternoon with a westering sun picking out small, shiny surfaces that glint off as it sinks, with Shandon's Tower and the Torrance of St. Vincent's in perfect silhouette on their respective heights, with the hooting of distant traffic, the faint cries of homebound schoolchildren, the convent bent three minutes early, the cathedral repeal three minutes late, with the Lee's majestic sweep past the maltings, almost imitating the gilded pomp of the Genil. Can you picture Cork briefly putting on the timeless grandeur of Granada? Neither can I. <laughs> that upset some Cork people. And I'm one of them. I was upset when I wrote it. Uh, you know, you probably know this, you recognize it. It's called Genesis. In the beginning was heaven and earth, and the earth was void and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the God moved over the waters, and God said, Let there be Fred Astaire, and there was Fred Astaire. <laughs> and God said, Whoops, light, let there be light. Sorry, Fred, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. If that's... <coughs> no, that's, that's not blasphemous. <coughs> What are we doing? Four and a half? <coughs> You've been gone 50. Oh, five minutes to go. So three Borgesian fragments. we dedicated to Tom McCarthy. The great Tom McCarthy. Not the lesser Tom McCarthy who was in the Denmark for running the water. <laughs> Hope still here tonight. <laughs> it is written, the history of the universe, including that sorry paragraph on human existence, is a tattered user's manual written by a minor disaffected god for the amusement of demons. Two, the man whose library card expired. I've been travelling for nights without cease down dimly lit corridors stretching into infinity, lying from skirting board to ceiling with innumerable books which catalogued the world from beginning to end without catching sight of a single librarian. Three, does God breathe? The mind of God is teeming with particulars, past and future fused together in a terrifying present. He does not deign to think. To think is to ignore, to abstract, to generalize, anatomy to him who dwells fully in the first dizzy particle in the last inert detail. Uh, you heard the news today about gravitational waves. This is, I suppose you could say it's uh, in that area. It's called Unbestimtheit. According to Heisenberg, we can never predict the exact position of Memphis or confidently declare the definitive momentum of Mother Nevat. Hey, Mr. Schrodinger, did you put out the cat? <laughs> something from the, uh... there are, <clears throat> sometimes there are poems that are just presented to you. I was cycling to work one morning and this just appeared in front of me and all I had to do was basically report on it. It's called Cartage. It's, it's dedicated to Matthew Sweeney because it's, it's more or less a poem in his area <coughs> and I basically nicked it. <laughs> Somewhere back at the traffic lights, perhaps, the chief morning cars may have lost contact with the hearse and then cut up again only to find the ice cream van clipping along cheerfully behind the coffin. 
<laughs> Either that, or the ice cream man is dead. <laughs> There's another one in here which is uh, based on that sort of, uh, if you're just around at the time and you're there, all you have to do is say what happened. And this is not it. <coughs> this is only completely, this is called, oh, fuck off. <laughs> is that, you know, that sort of, um, you know, somebody asks you a particular question at a particular time, you say, oh, fuck off, or just, just fuck off, basically. <laughs> oh, fuck off. Oh, fuck off. It's funny how to say it, actually, but you do it to me. Oh, fuck off. That's it. That's it. <laughs> no mention in the morning clarion of the miraculous appearance of the image of an image of the Blessed Virgin in raised pastry on a chicken and mushroom pie and fish and chip shop on South Douglas Road. Or the vast and already heaving multitudes quickly bust into place and into only decade after decade of the rosary. Or the swiveling dickhead Delevis lookalike who purchased the marvellous pie and insisted upon his inalienable right to consume it there and then, much to the chagrin of the murmuring throng. And yes, you do deck tired of it all, the entire or at least the observable universe, and the aloof orbital indifference of the planets, and the grotesque distances between stars, and the eternal oscillation between expansion and contraction and the growing realization that everything you have said and done up to now, with the understandable exception of an evening alone in the paradise of shadows of the Alhambra, may be part of an extremely elaborate dream you are having near tipsy mother's womb. Or the awful possibility that you are already a thousand years dead and haunting the shattered, empty shell of yourself, and the grim probability that it would have been infinitely better for all concerned if you had never been born. In fact, it would solve everything for once and for all if someone could arrange to send a little Dutch fucker back to a wormhole in the space-time continuum to stick his finger in the big pang. <laughs> and I'm going to finish with a, a title poem from this. You have to kind of imagine me being 30 years younger, much better looking, tanned, especially for the first line. <coughs> Muse, I am writing naked at the kitchen table when you steal in from the shower and stand on tiptoe at my shoulder. A few drops of your dripping hair splash onto the lamplit page, blurring the words I am deploying in your honour. With an abrupt kiss you slip into the bedroom, your seal of approval is still tingling from the nape of my neck down into the small of my back as I turn the dampened page and begin again. <laughs> Timing other poets, but when it comes to myself, I just uh, fall apart. <clears throat> um, apropos working class in Basel Bunting, um, when we were organising readings in Newcastle in the 60s, and uh, <clears throat> we invited uh, fucking whatever that name, <clears throat> and uh, Hugh McDermott, and uh, he came and gave a great reading and afterwards we were having a drink back at our flat and uh, Basil said to uh, McDermott um, this lad here uh, pointing to me um, working class lad you know he spells cunt with a K but he writes terrific poetry and McDermott said I hate that fucking working class <laughs> I think or I hope he meant it in a way that Johnson paid the poor, you know. But, uh, anyway. And as it's um, close to, uh, to Valentine's Day, uh, I'm going to read you a couple of Valentine poems. Um, This is uh, oh, so well organized before I came. Oh, used to. This is uh, <clears throat> Valentine's Day Massacre. <coughs> I bought her a dark amaryllis, 
black as a sack of coal. She said, shove it up your ass. So I binned it. My, uh, my wife called me recently, uh, this is a Valentine for her, and she recently bought me two extraordinary presents for my uh, recent 70th birthday. And uh, Valentine, only you bring such gifts and presents. A curl you call, I hear, I hear. And Stone Age axe, what reach you have. A flint heart, splint from rock, sparks flame to fire. I clasp it as I write. Um, I'm now living uh, on the Solway Firth, the uh, Irish Sea, and uh, on the estuary. And these are a few poems from that, from that place. As I knelt at a cold stove, waiting for a long draw to catch my light and take my time, my icy elements. A threshing rain laid into the roof. When the stove lit, I thought of her and desire. And what an exquisite word that is. At the estuary, sandlings dig bait, tailgate the first ripple of a returning tide. A mercury whisper of tipped in light rushed in in front of itself. Scrow clouds scuffed the height, swirls of wrung out rags, wind riven wind-driven waves, belly flop on rock. What the heart loves, loves not the heart. Winter Migrants, which is the title of my uh, forthcoming book. A mass of moth-eaten cloud, threadbare, and spun across a bullish moon. An animal wakes when I walk in winter, wrapped against a withering wind, solitary and the solway flat. Where winter migrants gather in long black lines along a silver sleek, heads held back, throats thrust toward an onshore rush. Occasionally, Cruciform, static in a flying wind, a zoo in obeisance to the sea. Each time, the season and the pecking mark. Retracing steps washed out by whimpering silt, they call as I approach an upright spelt on their shelf, gathering my notes and theirs. We scavenge ahead of our shadows, waiting for what the tide brings in or leaves out. Purple, hedged cloud, edged gold, hung on silver slates of sand. Diverted leaps of light, surrender water, risen from rivulets, roughed from rage, repeating waves repeat a curlew's estuary echo. Who but you? And the waves wake. Sorry that you read. Who but you and the winds wake? <clears throat> this is uh, a poem called Hawthorne from uh, the ballad of Jamie Allen. Jamie Allen, uh, I've got a whole book about him. He was a Northumbrian piper and um, a, a, a wonderful wonderful musician in the uh, 18th century. But he was also a terrible rogue, and when he wasn't making money from uh, surviving from his music, he would uh, steal horses and sell them, drive them across the border. Or his favorite trick was to uh, join the army as a recruit and get uh, a, f a fee for that, and then uh, get the recruiting sergeant drunk and escape. 
And mm -hmm. all of those things were capital offences. And because, because he was such a great musician, and a lot of the local aristocracy who were the Duke of Northumberland amongst them, um, managed to get him out of jail and stop him getting hung. But uh, he ended up, he died in jail uh, at the age of 77 when he stole a horse at the age of 70 and rode across the border. And, uh, he was an extraordinary man, border gypsy. Anyway, the, the, the book which uh, has a, you know, I, I went into the criminal records and found, and in the, in the army records and found in the book of deserters, numerous entries for him. And, uh, and also in the, in the criminal archive, there are uh, depositions and so on from his various horse thieving. But he was, he, he also, uh, in the book, uh, because it was, the only way I could find to research the project was to get commissioned to write an opera with uh, a friend of mine, uh, John Hall, a composer. And uh, that enabled me to, all he required was me to write 12 ballads. But uh, what I wanted to do was to get some money to do the research to find out about the guy's history, which I did. And which has nothing to do with this next poem. <laughs> <laughs> Hawthorne. There is a hawthorn on a hill, there is a hawthorn growing. It set its roots against the wind, the worrying wind that's blowing. Its berries are red, its blossoms so white, I thought that it was snowing. There is a hawthorn by a wall that looks down to the valley. Its berries are red, its thorns are sharp, it's where we said we'd marry. Its berries are red, its blossom is white, and the hail makes sharp weather. Without her now, I make my bed in the bleeding heaven. Come with me, oh come with me, come with me, my darling. The berries are red, the thorns are sharp, and the corbies are crying. Don't send me out, don't cut me down, don't exile me, my darling. The thorns turn red, kill the blossom dead, and the tethered wind is snarling. There is a hawthorn by a wall that looks down to the valley. Its berries are red, its thorns are sharp. It's where we said we'd marry. Its berries are red, its blossom is white, and the hail makes sharp weather. Without her now, I'll make my bed in the bleeding heaven. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel a bit self-conscious because me, something my wife said to me before I came out. She said she's never seen a hippie with a clipboard. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you mean, Pat? Yeah. You name me to say it. <laughs> This is homage, a haiku. A stripper strokes the slope of her hip, Hokazai painting Mount Fuji. For Bob, uh, and you know how it is when you suddenly have a line of poetry in your head and you don't quite know what to do with it. For Bob, the whole sweep of the day, if I were creamy, I'd know what I meant and make it a poem, but I'm not, and I don't, and I have. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Syncopation. So, she said, stripped and slipping into bed, do you have a copy of Machiavelli's The Prince, then? But what she craved was hard rock, ready to roll. He flopped a soft blob. She pounced a cat at a carpet scratch and blew him to insomnia by faithless. How would it be with the Goldberg variations, the late quartets, Bartok, Bebop, Bird, the Birds, Scriabin's <coughs> Hall, Exploding Atonal Hall, John Cage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, now this <clears throat> clearly doesn't refer to any of the wonderful ports here. 
in the audience of a performing festival, to gaud my frigging peers. Fuck the sonnet, I piss upon it, and those who seek to launch a sinking reputation on it. A zord were talismanic indenture, an entree to a toothless craft. Tack those billiards with your pocket, to reach the moon you need a rocket. <laughs> In uh, <clears throat> this next poem, uh, Wonga Wonga Land, uh, I mean, I was talking about this, this kind of disease, this virus, this reactionary trickle down sort of politics that's kind of you know, polluting the planet is, uh, I don't know, I mean, living with this, the government that we have in the UK is, uh, I found. The depth of my anger and hatred is fathomless. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, uh, the word gissy is Geordie Dyer, uh, word for pig. And uh, this is I, it's a poem called Wonga Wonga Land, and it was written. Uh, there was a UKIP um, politician who, when interviewed on Newsnight, Referred to some obscure you know, African country as, Wongo, uh, as Bongo Bongo land. And uh, so I call, now call England Wonga Wonga land. Uh, Wonga is, I don't know if you've got it over here, but a friend of David Cameron uh, set up a business called Wonga, which is uh, basically the loan sharks and they prey on the poor and uh, charge, you know, thousand percent interest rate. To poor fucks who you know who can't find any other way of raising uh, money. Wonder Wonderland. Doctor Gobbles, with his jowly wobbles, wants to stop the sick and jobless quaffing from his gissy goblets and break their backs on the rock of his salvation. He serves a cold buffet of hot wars to pump the economy for further plunder and squanders young lives like bankers on a company junket. If the hungry were hung, he'd hang the anger out, incentivized to fuck off and die. Or just have a jousting match of polite poetries. Once they bled themselves for a cure. Now they only bleed the poor. And this poem uh, kind of is, I suppose, a follow-on to that, although it was written a long time before it. Uh, you know, it's winter night. Streetlights flicker, windows shake, rain sweeps down, and I'm awake on this winter night. Put my bags down by the door. I won't bother you for more. Streets outside are long and cold. I am getting far too old. I don't need to be told on this winter night. Call a priest, call the Pope. Give me shelter, give me hope. Give me some more fucking dope. Sell my body for a bar of soap on this winter night. Ride the buses all night long, listen to a busker's song. He won't be singing that for long on this winter night. Fuck the beggars, fuck the poor, we don't need them anymore. Give me shelter, let me score on this winter night. Let me drink, Lord, let me sleep, I might be poor. But I'm not cheap. Give me snort, give me crack, give me smack, Lord, by the sack, till it breaks my fucking back on this winter night. Streetlights flicker, windows shake. I don't want to stay awake. Wind and rain and howling storm. Bless the day that I was born. Bottle breaking, bloody dawn, another winter night. And um, <clears throat> how are we doing that? For time? Right. This is uh, uh, 
Cast off. Um, the, but this poem was this book collected poems I had to re revisit all of my old efforts, and uh, so I decided to rewrite a few of them. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of them rewritten. So I'll read you both versions. Uh, cast off, 1981. Crouched over in a bowery doorway. I know a coat's forgotten. No one wears it anymore. And cast off 2011. Crouched over in a bowery doorway. An old poet's forgotten. No one reads him anymore. <laughs> Denial is a river in Egypt. God, I'm easy. A pushover for anyone with wine, a spliff, a condom in her back. I say no thanks and half a bottle later, we're on the nest. But we were two halves and neurotic genius, till you ditched me for a regular spot on a bar stool who's twice the man he was after one year of your home cooking. You have a way of turning toy boys into turkeys, and he's another fattening for the chop. He grabs your ass in crowded bars, confusing it for one of his slack chins. He has a sudden urge to scratch. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna, there's two poems to finish. This is Books of Ballast, which is <clears throat> a little poem from this book of prose. Um, and I don't know how it happened, but uh, living in London and the pile of mine and asked me to be, basically ended up as a getaway driver for uh, these marijuana smugglers. And uh, I mean, I didn't know what was happening to those two uh, <laughs> but the part of the job was to, uh, <clears throat> I mean, don't worry, you got punished. Um, the part of the job was to replace these boxes, you know, find some ballast, and bit ever being an opportunist, I sold them a whole lot of books to fill the boxes. <laughs> and, uh, they, uh, as well as me, wages as a drug. And then, um, and then we had to go and get more. And I thought books was the obvious best thing. So we drove around and get stuff, fill in the boxes with books. So there's books as ballast. The old Baraboy bookseller was blissful as we bought a space wasting, dust gathering, back breaking, spirit deadening, unread and unreadable text. All those pounds of printed pages by preening politicians, punting preemptive wars, permissioned by pliant preachers, anemic academics, bloated bishops, geriatric generals, corpulent combatants, high ranking heroes were hemorrhoids. All that cataclysmic cataplasm, that militaristic mucus, that pedantic pus from festering farts, the self-engaging entrails of emetic ambassadors, pestiferous papers by prudish pedagogues, Muppet memoirs by mop-topped metropolitan mugwumps, <laughs> dross from dysfunctional dukes and their drama queens-to-be, conquering chronicles by conceited commanders, acne abortions by abstinence abstractors, asphyxiating articles by arthritic archbishops, bromicidal broadsides by boisterous broadcasters, asthmatic excretions by abject aesthetes, moralizing morsels from minging mercenary millionaires, windy waffle from former center forwards, bird brain banter from juiced up journals, celebrity cackle from coked up khaki crown crack beads, pontificating prime time poseurs, promoting puffed up personalities, mendacious manuals by manic muff munching mullers, post bomb pancakes flipped from non-stick pans, stuck to the threadbare ceiling of their own gravitas. Tit-tat-twitter-twatter of talk show hosts, 
canting sofa cunts, coughing up chintzy chunder, corporate cant from help self cabalists, gungy gush for the gullible by gutsy gurus, pathetic prattle by puffed up pop stars, half baked chicken livered foul mouth chefs with cooked up confessions, ghost written garbage for tongue tied twats, interminable table talk by truculent talentless torags, bloated tomes by toady poets who sit in circles blowing prizes of each other's arseholes <laughs> and straws. <laughs> and one more question. You do, yeah. Five minutes. Well done. Well done. Perfect. Right. Just I'll finish with this uh, show. This poem called Lark and Merlin. And I lived for about ten years in the highest cafe, and I think it was the highest residence in England, possibly in the UK, I'm not sure. And, and uh, that's that's it. And um, and these on sale, these postcards. And the 15 of them, and I took the photograph. And you know, I write a poem on the inside of one of them if you buy them. And um, <laughs> anyway, it was an extraordinary place. It was the cafe, the cl I lived above this cafe, and, uh, and uh, it closed in winter. But I think, well, I was shut. I was, I think I was twice uh, snowed in for six weeks. You know, it was extraordinary on top of the fells, the mountains, you know, and uh, just. Just to have that experience uh, was extraordinary, and I had to document it in photographs and poems and so on. So th th this poem comes out of that experience, basically. Lark and Merlin, and the Merlin is the small falcon, and not the guy with a long grey beard, <laughs> like we had on earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Lark and Merlin. A wren perched on a hawthorn, low enough to skip the scalping winds, sang the scalpel song. Sea frets drift sheer along shorelines. Listening to hail spray glass and wind, and a waitress laugh, and a cafe without customers, I fell to fell thinking. A sullen light through vapor thins a line of hills. The edge of everything is nothing whipped by wind. Watched on a webcam bound to a bedpost, gag on my shelf. Rose blush of roadkill rabbit, insides out, on Tom McGowan. Cumulus in a tarn, its fast shadow flees far hills. A wave of sleek grass skips mist. My hand thought of her, a photograph waiting to happen. This come to kill wind rips at the root. Here she comes and there she goes, rushes bound to rhyme. I should shut down, close all, stop if I could. How quick the mist, how quick. My lover, the assassin, is beautiful. She is going to kill me, and I concur. Just now she sleeps, but when she wakes, I'm dead. Her eyelids flitter. As I prepare her potions for delicious poisons. As she flew past, uh, as she flew past, a lick of her melodic nectar stuck to my wing, making flight for an instant sticky, but nothing preening couldn't fix. She asked about my heart, its evasive flight, but can I trust her with its secrets? And does a Merlin? In fast pursuit of its prey, tell the fleeing lark it is enamoured of its song, or the singing lark turn tail and fly into the falcon's talons. My heart, the cartographer, charged to the waterline, is swept back as the tide turns, wiping the map blank, wave after moon drawn wave. But it beats my heart. Of its own volition. A lark sings, winds rush reeds. Walking home, I stride these tracks with her tread, the blurred thumbprint of 
the smudged moon. It has gone on for days, strumming rushes, taking up tails, taking them on, the fall of my foot on tufts. A stroke of light along a law, laying in under a long cloud, by a crete likened to limestone, sphagnum to peat. Late shadows gather in the dark, words unwrite as they are written, unspeak as they are spoken, songs sprung from heart and lung to tongue unsung. Drunk winds stumble over shuffling roofs, shake his sleep with dreams a lost love will not let go. Recurring swirls of old gold, blown light. You can't help but be in it as it opens and falls back on itself, unfolds and unsays. I do not want to die without writing the unwritten pleasure of water. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. questions, I don't want to forget to say that um, Tom's collected poems, The Work of a Lifetime, it's not the average slim volume, it's 300 pages, it's priced £19.95 <coughs> sterling, which translates to around 27, 28 euros. Uh, Tom is very generously putting on sale here tonight for 18 euros, you won't get a book at a better price than that. They're also selling Jerry Murphy's uh, books cheaper than the capitalists on the high street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you work for those capitalists. I did once, yeah. yeah well, my two ages, ladies. Um, lads, the humour that can be found in your work, does it arise organically out of your own personal world views, or do you occasionally, deliberately uh, write for that? No, organically, definitely. I'm just good like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first one that came to me. Jeez, no, deliberately, you know, okay. no, it's, it's, it's inspiration, it just, just happens. Fair enough. Well, I don't have, have, have a humorous, sorry. Sorry, no, no, but you know, the, the cortege. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that just happened. It's just yeah, but of course somebody else looking at it might be found it funny, so... Every <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> guy in the coffin. <laughs> That's where genius comes in. So, you know, if you're just... You know, I suppose you're, you're open, to, open to that sort of thing, mm -hmm. basically. Sorry. I, uh, I don't know, I find the world humorous uh, as a way... And also, I spend a lot of time in a... Well, not a lot of time, but anyway, yeah, in a shipyards and... Well, I was meant to go, go when I was <clears throat> left school at 40 and a career advisor. I wanted to be a motor mechanic, but he thought I should be a, a welder in a shipyard. You know. And uh, anyway, I, and I, I never, and Tyneside was full of, you know, part of Tyneside was armaments manufacturing, shipbuilding, and coal mining and engineering. And uh, I became a poet instead. But uh, I got back into the shipyards in uh, the 80s, I think. And uh, I always wanted to find out, uh, you know, what I'd missed. And what I discovered was the kind of black humour, you know, the gallows humour that Because mm. uh, it's a hell of an environment, really, a cruel, savage... Uh, Serious humour. Yeah. So, so I always felt it was a, a grey one. Mm.